Welcome to this. Okay. Oh, welcome to the building science. To the building science podcast. 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 Welcome to the building science podcast. Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. So welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. I'm Christoph Irwin. I'm not here with Miguel. He's taken the day off. I'm here, though, with a good friend and colleague of mine, Corbett Lunsford. Hello, Corbett. Hello, Christoph. Corbett is the uh, leader and founder of the Building Performance Workshop. He's also got Home Performance YouTube channel. You should definitely check that out if you haven't already. And super exciting, he's got a show on PBS called Home Diagnosis. That'll start uh, airing this winter um, or in the spring. That's so exciting. Thank you. As a society, we so need pushback to what HGTV does, which is the implicit message of homes are all about what they look like and how much they cost. Right. And I know we all think, I mean, people who are listening to this probably are mostly practitioners or we also have... Okay, so we... Everybody thinks that, oh, my town is backwards. And I'll tell you, as somebody who built uh, the highest performance tiny house on wheels in the world, not because I'm a tiny house person, but because I want to teach people about home performance. He is, in fact, a full-size human. Just I, I am. But we, we still live in this tiny house. It's called the Tiny Lab. You can search it online. It's hashtag Tiny Lab. Um, and we still live in it. I have two little girls. I have two cats and uh, a beautiful wife who has high uh, expectations for life and beauty and quality. And anyway, we uh, toured around and we had 7,000 people come into the house in 34 cities. And basically nobody who's a normal person, and I mean that if capital N, capital P, knows what a blower door is even still. And it's, oh my you know, goodness. it's amazing. I mean, you set it up and they're like, whoa, what's that? I've never seen that before. Exactly. So that's why we made the television shows because it's just, it's not okay yeah. that HGTV gets to do what they do and there's nobody even knows that there's... That proof is possible, which is the name of the tour. So just to, you know, anyone that is a layman here, imagine you went to the doctor and they took out a blood pressure cuff and you said, what's that? Mm -hmm. Right. There was a time where someone said you should measure blood pressure. And I would just imagine the established industry said, no, 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 no. Leeches. Leeches And the converse is we totally think it's okay for anybody in the building industry to come into our house and give an opinion or a recommendation without doing any vital measurements at all. Like that's normal. And that is insane. It is insane to do that. So uh, it is incredibly optimistic. It, yeah, right. And it's insane <laughs> not just from the building science point of view, but we're also from the chemistry and indoor air quality, which is what um, why I'm here in Austin yeah, and why and we what get to we're here to talk about today. Yeah. Um, so what what we're here we're at the campus where Christoph used to work as a physicist um, and an engineer, and it's the uh, pickle. We have all kinds of funny names. J.J. Pickle. I'm, yeah. we're, we're right off Boner <laughs> Avenue. Um, it's all these Texas guys with these hilarious last names. So anyway, we're here because this is the location, the site of the biggest indoor air quality experiment in history, essentially. Bum, they, bum, right? bum. Yes, it's very exciting if we had all the Seriously. papers and everything. So basically, outdoor chemistry has been really studied well because we've got policy around it. EPA, you know, all, all the... Kyoto Protocol and, you know, all this, these agreements that everybody has about climate change and, and uh, ozone layer levels and ozone layer levels on the ground, which are bad. Ozone layer levels up high, good. Ozone on the ground, bad. Um, things like, you know, sulfur dioxide and uh, NOx and um, hydroxyl radicals and all these different things that they're studying outside. They actually took a second to look inside of a house and they found out that, number one, um, we're containing the space. So the chemistry is much more interesting and advanced because we're not letting it all get away. Right. And secondly, the levels of every single thing that they measure in outdoor chemistry are astronomically higher inside. And add to that that we spend 90% of our life inside. What they've been doing basically has been um, a waste of time. If you look at priorities, like we should have been looking at inside of houses the whole time. Yeah, the outdoors you can compare, you know, protect yourself from, but inside is where we're keeping our children and our babies, and that's essentially who this is about. If you, you know, anybody who's listening to this will, it's like, well, I live in a house with spray foam and formaldehyde everywhere, and I don't feel anything. It's not about you. You're already broken and damaged, and you're dying. Like with the I am, you are, Christoph. What we're talking about is three months old and two year olds and ten year olds, right? Mm-hmm. Who are still developing. Their brain is still developing. So. And with these epigenetic studies, potentially the next generations of people. 
exactly their, their genes can be impacted exactly yeah your exposure because to you're that. yeah your 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 genes will remember what any when you pass it on them so um i think that i've learned a lot of things that give me pause oh yeah about making recommendations about anything in home performance now because everything that I have been doing is like based on the four elements which are heat flow, airflow and pressure, moisture and air quality. And when I say air quality, I mean relative humidity and temperature and light and sound and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and maybe something like radon. I am not thinking about phthalates and bisphenols and flame retardants and um, chemical compounds that are in the gas phase and then uh, particles that are hanging out in them, and it's just—it's oh, very um, particles are constantly morphing back and forth, and they're changing, they're transforming. So it's like, you know, I call building science like music, right? So you get harmony, which is relationship to things out of time. So the, the water heater's relationship with the fireplace, right? Even though they're not in the same room, we, anybody who knows building science knows those two things are very closely linked. Have That's to be in harmony. harmony, right? And then you've got melody, which is consequence. One thing leads to another leads to another. Mm. But this is like taking this music analogy and um, not just looking at sheet music, but literally playing it out loud in a room where now the room is like echoing and you've got the harmonics of the room. And it's just very, wow, it's, it makes you blame. But yeah, my brain is exploding after this week. And so we're, we're putting out a lot of stuff on the YouTube channel. We're going to try and incorporate it into the TV show um, and into little interstitials, like little kind of basically commercials that go on PBS that are just little tiny bits of information. So, so first of all, what we're here to talk about is this program called Home Chem, which, yeah. as I understand, is it's supported by the acronym. Sloan Foundation. Yes, so, so the talking Sloan about Foundation. Home Chem. So what's cool is, is the Sloan Foundation is specifically about science, um, forwarding the public understanding of science and technology in the modern age is their byline. They do not research human health. So that's one thing that this is not going to be about ever. But they have committed, yeah, they've committed $50 million and 10 years to studying the chemistry of the indoor environment. That's their, wow. what their program is called, Chemistry of the Indoor Environment. Home Chem is this iteration right now, and that's, it's an acronym. It stands for House Observations of Microbial and Environmental Chemistry. And essentially what they did is got a, the test house at University of Texas Austin, which is totally outfitted with all these sensors. They, they have characterized it as what they call an academic building science. They, they've characterized this house very, very well. They've been studying it for 11 years, basically. Mm -hmm. So they know all kinds of stuff about it, and they know how to tune it to do whatever researchers want. So these chemists brought four and a half million dollars of testing instruments here. They have this week, well, this week, uh, this month. I'm sorry, it's all of June. Grace and I were only here for a week because we couldn't. It would have been crazy to spend the, the entire month. We got so much this week. We've got more than we could possibly handle. But anyway, wow. they put trailers, these four trailers, around the house because it would have been. Um, they would have filled up the entire house with equipment, basically. So they had all of these hoses taking samples from inside the house, generally around the kitchen, which is a central part of the house, and then taking them out of the house into trailers where they do things like mass spectrometry and gas chromatograph analysis. And um, they, did a, they had a laser and they had all these different things. So you, you'll see all of this in the YouTube videos that are coming soon. But essentially, they were looking at cooking and cleaning and occupancy and the chemistry that comes out of those things. So basically when you cook tomatoes and you make toast and then you wipe the counter with a Clorox wipe, what happens over the coming six hours or longer? And that's actually something that they found out is that it lasts a lot longer than they thought. And this is in a house that's um, not only leaky, it's like seven air change per hour at 50 if you were to just let it sit there, which they're not doing because they wanted to make sure that the wind never messed with the numbers. They're doing these tests again and again and again. They wanted to have the infiltration be the same all the time, so they actually pressurized the house with a um, ventilator so that they had 0.6 air changes constantly the entire month. And it still lasted a lot longer. The chemicals were still sticking to surfaces. They'd come off later and they'd interact with the chlorine atom yeah. that came off of the blah, blah, blah. It was very interesting. So that I think that the big things that they were finding is that ozone, what they suspected is ozone has a huge effect Guess how you bring ozone into your house? Um, you open a window. You open 
a window or a door. Or a door. How crazy is that? So it's a nice that thing outside. Okay. Right, no, Do you no, guys of have, course. at home actually open windows and doors? Um, and so, you know, this, it's just so interesting. I, I learned, right, when I started learning about indoor quality and home performance and, and how leaky houses actually are based on what we think they are, which mm-hmm. is, you know, most people's houses are way leakier than they think they are. And I heard about the air quality index, which is this, you know, EPA thing of, like, right. oh, don't go outside today. It's hot. It's the air quality is bad. Mm-hmm. Ozone and, and, action day. Yeah, my mind goes, hey, where do you think your air in your house comes from, idiots? <laughs> but now I actually have learned that the cracks in your house, ozone is very sticky. It likes to stick to stuff. So when it comes in through the gaps and cracks in your house, it actually does get caught on the way. Your house acts as a filter, mm-hmm. like the enclosure is a filter at that yeah. point. So that's kind of cool. I've heard um, that before. I believe it's like a Merv 11 filter or something. Oh, like yeah. That. That's, if it's you would know that. ACH 50 of 5. Yeah, that's Ian Walker, LBNL. I guess. Awesome, awesome. Double check. That. Yeah, Christoph's Mind is the one that you go to if you need details about any of this stuff. I'm more of a um, the communicator. I'm a hearts and minds kind of guy. Hearts and minds. I, re- I remember the details that are important for winning the hearts and minds. But yeah, that's I'm important. Not. I mean, that is so important, Corbett, just to be straight. Like, uh, ignorance and apathy is really the big issue. Mm. It's like... It's like we're making food and society won't admit it's hungry. Right. So what's the point? It's hungry. Right. So what's the point? That actually brings up a good point. So food, anything that goes in your mouth is regulated very strictly. We got the FDA, we got the USDA, we got all these different things. Um, things that you touch also, right? Well, let me just interject. It's not regulated quite oh, as strictly as not in Not as strictly Europe. as you would think that they would be, <laughs> okay, right? Okay, but keep going. But, uh, but there are speak. regulations for that. Uh-huh. What you breathe inside is not right. Re- and especially in your house, there are no regulations. It's that can the wild west. And it's not just that, oh, well, I want to smoke in my house. Okay, f- fine, do that. But did you realize that you're smoking? Plus your Clorox wipes, plus the fact that you like to cook with curry makes a, like a unique yeah, situation. Indoor that chemistry is, Yeah, like that's the thing is that we've got this layering, which is not an American. Americans hate complexity and layers, uh-huh. right? We want it to just be like, just tell Give me what me to do. Give me the pill. And I even do me. that, right? Yeah, we were having this interview with this woman, Arlene Bloom, who runs this thing called Six Classes. She's, she runs the Green Science Policy Institute. All right, and put she, that in the show notes. Yeah, she's, she's awesome. She's a mountain climber, too. That's her main thing, what she's famous for, but she's also a biophysical chemist, and she um, has okay. been basically breaking down... Um, chemicals that we should be controlling, unnecessary chemicals, into classes. Instead of just saying, we should not have brominated tris in kids' pajamas in the 1970s, which then, as soon as they outlawed that, manufacturers turned right around because it's the fastest thing they could do is to use chlorinated tris instead, which no one has any data about. So then they study that and they find out, oh no, this is also a mutagen that can cause cancer in children, and it also ends up in kids' urine and blood within one night of sleeping in these jammies. So that, that outlawed. And so instead of chasing after each individual chemical, they're trying to, like, class them into families, mm-hmm. right? And that, I think, is the... That's interesting because I don't... I'm not a policy guy. I don't really think that the government is the answer for home performance, personally, mm-hmm. that we try to... Yeah, yeah. We want right? people to ask for good stuff. Exactly. So if we can get normal people to ask for home performance, for with the performance that they want, that's better. But as far as the chemical stuff goes, I really kind of agree with the scientists that like there's no way for a normal person even me who thinks about this stuff all the time to really navigate all the chemicals and all the interactions that could happen we need governments to ban certain things which they've been doing in in the like Europe. like you and I just heard at your building science happy hour mm-hmm, last, last night. night that china outlawed our drywall 15 years ago <laughs> because they know that it sucks and it's got all this nasty stuff in it that's cheap, right? Because that's the thing is that like fast yeah. and cheap is our, ah, it's just, anyway, all this stuff is, is just been a very um, major exploration. Yeah, fly ash in sheep rock. Huh? Mm-hmm. Ash in sheep rock. Huh? Mm-hmm. So, so you're going. You're talking about food versus air, and food is unregulated. And we know when we put food in our body. Exactly. We know that somebody at least has a regulation about something. Like you're not allowed to use arsenic in mm-hmm. right making things. So if you uh, like organic food, is there such a thing as like organic air? Is there a way to get something right like something like equivalent? This is the problem, and and I think that the answer you and I already have, which is that 
home performance will take you a long way there. Mm -hmm. Downside is, and, and this gentleman, George, who was George talking Swanson, about yeah. George Swanson, who is the magnesium oxide guy in the U.S., yeah. he said the alternative to drywall. Um, I don't think that he would mind us talking about this, but no. it really affected me because I have a, a three-month-old baby. Phew. That's such a that he um, and that your baby has more lung area to body weight than right. They breathe do. more. I mean, it's like and their the respiration rate's higher. So his baby was born in an airtight house in Iowa, high performance airtight house, and he and unbeknownst to him, the products that he had used have formaldehyde in them. I'd say that some of the stuff that's coming out, like there's this group called um, there's a, a score called Hayward Score. I don't know if mm -hmm. you're familiar oh, yeah. with it, but we've interviewed those there on the podcast. okay, great. So, so I'm sure that Bill would have talked about the fact that, like, really, you could try and get free of unnecessary chemicals, you're never going to get there. Yeah. You get like, there's just stuff in everything. And we were talking about Axe yesterday's Axe, what do you mean? Axe body spray. Oh. They did a chemical analysis of Axe on the back of the, the bottle, it says it's six ingredients, but. Dr. Richard Corsi here in this building did an analysis of with a mass spectrometer and actually found 100 chemical compounds in it. Not six ingredients, 100. And they just don't have to tell you what's in these things. And so like for us... fragrance, it's a yeah, trademark or something. Exactly. And it's yeah. proprietary. Exactly. So you're not allowed to find out what it is. And I think that that is the, the bottom line is that we cannot, even if you wanted to try and regulate your own exposure to things, you cannot yeah. because you are not allowed to because you don't have the information. Yeah. And that's the thing that you and I are trying to do is like get people the metrics so that they can have the proof, have a metric so that they can make an informed decision. And if they're going to take a risk, at least it's a calculated risk. If there's no information about this stuff. There is no way to, we're all ignorant. But yeah. So yeah, it's, we're living in the chemical age, like it or not. If a manufacturer is responsible or trying to be responsible and they do exposure studies, you're, what you're saying implicitly is they couldn't permute the exposure with all the other associated chemicals that could be present in that environment. So who knows if it's safe? Right? Yes, I don't know what permutes is, but means, but that, that sounds right. Change um, <laughs> permutation. Okay, I get it. So in you know the other thing is when we focus on air tightness, you and I, and I mentioned this yesterday at the at the group. It blew my mind. I'm sitting here with these chemistry researchers. One of them is the tool maker of Home Chem, Delphine Farmer. She designed and built some of the chemistry instruments that they're using, and she builds airtight, gas tight, like air is a gas, right? So let's just back up for a second. Air is a gas. If we build something gas tight, it means that it has to, to uh, hold up to a certain vacuum. Mm -hmm. So I say, here's the assembly that I'm building my house, my next house with, and I want to know if this, um, potentially this polyisocyanurate foam that I want to put on the outside of the house is going to migrate in at me. And I'm going to tell you that there's an airtight layer, um, you know, here, there's an airtight layer here. And she's like, well, no, no, it's not airtight. If it's vapor open, but airtight, that's totally ridiculous. That is scientifically insane to say vapor open, airtight. Air is a gas. Vapor is a gas. They're both gases. They can both get through. So what we Water's a little smaller than air, but they're both... A tiny, 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 tiny bit, but yeah. there's no way... Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> what we're doing here is really talking about substantive... Air tightness, like mm -hmm. air tightness, that's airtight enough for a per, blower door. Per ASTM, exactly. Standard. Fifty pascals is what we're talking about when we do blower mm -hmm. and door. And a certain stuff. mass flow rate, exactly. Yeah. And and she said, okay, fifty pascals. She turned around and did a little calculation. She was like, oh, okay. When I say airtight, like gas tight, I'm talking about a million times more airtight than what you're talking about. So we're on totally different pages. And I think that that is the thing that this, the, the products that we're using, foam as an example, let's just talk about foam for a second. I'm not an anti-foam guy. If it's in the right place, it can have, mm -hmm. right? So a sub-slab, there really isn't much else that you can use underneath a slab that's going to withstand the weight. But all foam right now in America is required to have flame retardants in it. And flame retardants come out all the time. Mm -hmm. And they're gases, and they're going to get through things that you and I call airtight. And that spooks me, because, yeah. you know, whether or not there's a, a pressure differential, if the pressure is the same, they're still coming through, because it's based on high-low, right? In building science, we're talking about everything goes from high to low. High to low concentrations, high to low, uh, you know, gravity-wise, high to low moisture, high to low temperature, etc., and so this idea that these things are just beaming through drywall and what I thought was an airtight surface and it's coming in at my house. And so my neighbor might have something in their house that is getting somehow into my house. And like that 
And anyway, it's just it's just a very complicated yeah. story, and I think that it's not something to get super afraid about, which I am struggling to do. But it is something that we should um, pay attention to and mm-hmm. really start delving into. This is basically a new field. They're founding a new field of scientific inquiry, which is indoor absolutely. Chemistry. I mean, and, and the Sloan Foundation, you know the the awesome quote about the indoor microbiome Im- impacting the human microbiome, and the human microbiome was quoted as being uh, as though another organ system. That one that regulates and impacts every other organ system, and one about which Western medicine knows virtually nothing. Right. But getting back to the outgassing, right? So you know, vinyl flooring with phthalates is a very well-known example of outgassing. Phthalates are plasticizers, and they're in all sorts of things: sealants, caulks, yeah. uh, cosmetics. They make like things that. flexible. Flexible, right? So you vinyl flooring, you don't want it to get brittle. So you put it in, you install it with this phthalate. And then anybody listening that's done demolition of old vinyl flooring, you'll notice that what? It's brittle. So what does that mean? Mm. The phthalate left. Well, where did it go? I mean, it didn't just drip out and end up in the dirt, which actually wouldn't be much better. The phthalate went into the room over those 15, 20 years. Yeah, and got, got into dust and just stuck to the dust. And, and then, then your baby your went by with its hands and feet and, you know, and then it breathed it in. And, and like, yeah, don't think about or you. Or you breathed it in. I mean, yeah, and I, and I think that that's... It would be much easier if we just thought about, like, kids. Because me, I grew up eating, like, I don't know. We could oh, yeah, go on and on about, roll. like, the horrible stuff that we ate as kids. Oh, yeah, I our generation, you mean. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pan slice of Pizza Hut pizza every day in high school with a Dr. Pepper. Yep. Every single day. Yeah, me day. too. Super big yeah. gulps. A Sprite was considered, like, on a, healthy soda. Oh, yeah, on a grease-proof... <laughs> um, uh, little like uh, wax paper paper thing thing, right and it wasn't wax paper it was like something not as good right whatever it was and that has then highly fluorinated chemicals anything that's stain repellent or Mm -hmm. grease proof Mm -hmm. or waterproof has highly fluorinated chemicals which is like these are chemicals so this is something that's really interesting that we're not getting too much into in this study but with the the Arlene Bloom conversation which is going to be on the YouTube channel uh, Highly fluorinated chemicals are the number one class. That's class one of what she looks at in the six classes. That's at sixclasses.org, by the way, if you want to look at this while I'm talking. Highly fluorinated chemicals are man-made chemicals 100% of the time. And there is no, there's nothing like them in nature. So when they get into your body, your body literally doesn't even know what it's looking at. It's <laughs> like if you saw an alien, you might just walk right by it because your eyes literally did not understand what they were looking at. Mm, right? So it's the same thing. So the, tra- the people who take out the trash in your cells don't recognize it. They leave it there. The, the, um, you know, any of the other organisms, they're do- doing their little thing, the little enzymes and whatever, and they're cleaning up and they're making sure that everything's in the right place. They don't know what this thing is, and so they just leave it. So it's just in your body forever, and it's going to last forever. It's called a forever chemical. And so it's just there. And it, is and it an endocrine get- system disruptor? Do you know? Yes. Yes, and and there's all kinds of if you look at the yeah out. look at the six classes thing because there's all kinds of like you could look at male fertility problems that are uh, associated with it, all this stuff, and essentially it's just it, that it's hard to replace these things because like yeah they make our life more convenient, mm-hmm. and so we need to have this conversation about what's it what's it worth, and if you're 80 years old and you don't care if you die tomorrow, by all means use it. Right. right. This is that's the this is America conversation, which is I should be able to do what I want. If you want to poison yourself, which people do with mm-hmm. vaping and smoking and doing drugs and whatever, like you Even know, fast food. But in fast right. food context, pretty much in 2018, <laughs> you know when you're dripping that burger, right. that and it's going to stay in your face. It's not going to somebody else's face. But this is all stuff that can hurt other people around mm-hmm. you, and, and and your kids especially, and and elderly people. If you don't want them to die, like doing stuff to prolong their life is helpful. And the air that they breathe is the most important. It's ABC for a reason, right? When you do CPR, airway, breathing, circulatory. So, like, their heart pumping is not as important as them being able to get breath. There's two really important points there. One is that their society has this implicit assumption that the industry that delivers conditioned space to it has done everything else right such that we can focus on visuals and economics. When in reality, it's been first cost optimized for decades and there's no uh, sophisticated understanding or clarity. So so that's one important point. And the second one is that um, we do like nice stuff in our society, right? So once you get to the first point, well, my implicit assumption that this stuff is okay is Mm -hmm. wrong, then you start to say, well, I want good air quality. 
and then what you're saying and, and what we've what I've been listening to, I'm, a, I'm again, I'm aghast. I'd like to make a third point after this. But the second point is, oh, now I want good stuff. There's no data to tell me what good stuff is. Right. right? You know, and bringing it out there. So the, the last one is we should be given um, the ability to choose, right? And, and we're really not. Mm-hmm. We're really, uh, yeah. Okay, so talk to me a little bit more about Axe Body Spray. What might it do when it's... On well, you. I mean, so it's polluting everyone you're walking so, around. Yes. With. So number one, when you spray it, it's not on you. It's on everyone. And also it's, um, six to your skin. These hundred compounds are not fragrance. In fact, a very small portion of them are what you smell. They are also things like they put something in there. They, so they have, it's kind of musical. They have what's called top notes. Mid notes and bass notes. What? Yeah. In so, acts? Um, in, per, in perfume, in general. So fragrances have the top notes are things that are going to wear off very soon. Uh, one of the top notes that's going to be in um, acts, for example, is uh, when you spray it on you, it has this thing that is going to vaporize very quickly. And it gives you that feeling that you're refreshed. It cools you down. And that's a chemical reaction. Yes. You're not actually refreshed. They are totally tricking your body, <laughs> and making you think that oh, I'm so refreshed now. So yeah, they just basically put some stuff on you. It's the same as like hand sanitizer, right? It makes you feel like oh, I'm clean now. But really, what you did is just, just killed an army of little bugs and then spread them all over so that their legs and their arms or everything all over your hands. And those little bugs are beneficial for you. But some of them are. Yes, exactly. So anyway, just what we think is happening, what's actually happening, are totally disconnected. So anyway. Um, so we've got the, the mid notes are going to last a little longer, and then the base notes are things that are going to last all day long. So you notice that you smell differently after you know, cologne on; it's not going to smell the same at the end of the day. Uh, and that's about breeding and mating and stuff, right? This these it's supposed think, to mimic. Pheromones. I don't know if they think that deeply about it, okay. but I will say that if you go, if you buy a product that is not supposed to be scented, like you're buying body spray, clearly the scent is what you're going for. Um, but if you buy something that's like a cleaning product that's scented. The reason it's scented is partly because you need to be told that it's clean by the lemon scent. And so, like, people are dumb. They don't think something's clean unless they smell lemons. That's ridiculous, right? We can all... If something doesn't smell like anything, we could assume that it's clean unless it's got carbon monoxide or rating, which is a totally different <laughs> conversation. But um, the idea that We're just so trapped, right? So, so this this scent that they're going to put in here, which a lot of them, so so in the, in the case of cleaners, what they were testing is chlorine base, chlorine. You know what that smells like? It's like a pool or bleach, um, and terpene base. Terpene is anything that's piney or fruity, like citrus, lemon, anything like that. Those are terpenes. They are not naturally derived. They're not squeezing lemons into a <laughs> jar and taking them. They have a factory where they manufacture these molecules, right? So <clears throat> they're going to manufacture these things and put them in there, partly to make you happy, but also partly to mask the chemical smells that are deeper in this soup that oh, they're giving you, right? And so that's partly what's going on. So if you can choose things that are uh, scent-free, that are unscented, if you smell something... Now you're like, ooh, I can smell the chemicals. And then you might want to go with something like, you know, that's a little bit more familiar to or a little bit more simple. And that's something that's interesting. Vinegar, right, is very simple. Mm -hmm. Let's use that instead of something that's very complicated. Just for the the, the very simple reason that there's not some uh, probably white guy with glasses um, who has an evil look on his face trying to, like, sneak some stuff into my house that I don't know about. Yeah. This is the way that I think about it. Just, mm-hmm. It's helpful for me to think about that guy and be like, I'm going to piss him off because he's trying to manipulate me. I don't like that. Mr. Clean, get rid of dirt and grime and grease in just a minute. Mr. Clean, go clean your whole house and everything to dinner. So I think that that, um, that just gets on my nerves a little bit. And I think that, that simpler solutions, water is a great cleaning solvent. Use water as much as possible. Absolutely, yeah. It's I, I've read that the chemical industry coming out of World War II, they had been making chemical biological weapons and, you know, and things to kill mosquitoes to prevent malaria. It basically regrouped and said, "All right, we got to sell some chemicals to. We got to find some stuff to, to the do. homeowners." And you know, like, oh, so this chemical is for cleaning wood. This one's for cleaning for mica. Mm-hmm. This one's for cleaning glass. And mm-hmm. you end up with this like super creepy yeah, this like a super fun site under every kitchen sink in the US yeah. so a couple things that I want to interject one is this idea of when we're talking about you know the three P's like pollutants pathways and people 
Um, you know, the pollutants existing is a given. The pathways into you is why dust is so important, for example. But then the people, there's, there's a big difference in people, right? And it's interesting how we say, oh, man, this is really a problem for your three-month-old. And this is really a problem for this geriatric patient. But for people in between, what we're essentially saying is the body is robust enough that it can detoxify and handle this level of burden, this level of environmental burden. Right. Well, personally, I don't want to handle unnecessary burdens. I've got enough yeah, that's on true. my mind, you know. It's, it is interesting. This, you know, the, uh, probably you've, um, if you're listening to this, you might have seen the guy who turned blue from colloidal silver from drinking it. Oh and this is, some, this is an example of your body handling it, right? It just, it, when it finds colloidal silver ions in your body, it will take them and sequester them in your skin because it's the furthest place from the necessary stuff that it, the body needs to do to do its job. So this guy, and then it gets exposed to light, and then it changes color and it turns somebody blue, wow. which is pretty crazy. But like that's the thing, your body actually is that how they do is, the Blue Man Show in Vegas? Excuse I, me. Yeah, no, actually, I tried out for that <laughs> when, back you? when I was a musician. When I was a I, I had tried out for Blue Man Group, and we got as far as putting the paint on and dressing up in full costume. Um, it's a very rigorous. It's like the Navy SEALs of the performing arts. Oh my goodness! And um, we, at the end of the night, we we're like, "Thank God we didn't get this job because this sucks." Like taking this stuff <laughs> off every night was just a total nightmare. Okay, but back, but to, the back to this. Yeah. Um, the, your body awesome. is an idiot. So your body's job is to disseminate um, replicas of itself, have babies, right? So you're gonna men being led around by their uh, primates. <laughs> And also, your body, if it finds like metals in your blood, like mercury, for example, it's going to put it in places that it thinks are not very important, which apparently are your heart, your brain, and your liver. What? That's crazy to me. But anyway, that's where your body puts nasty your stuff that it finds. Deep yes, that's where it's. Because you don't, you know, eh, I guess We're you can put up with a, a bunch of abuse. Yeah. <laughs> um, you could be pretty dumb and still have. A bunch of kids. That's I guess that's possible. Wow. So um, anyway, I think that this idea that your body can handle it or that your body can develop immunities is probably true. And that's why I think it's so masking to look at adults and say, oh, well, what's the problem? Well, I ate a hamburger for dinner last night. I had all kinds of stuff going on this morning. I, you know, did whatever. I, I stood by my tailpipe. For 15 minutes while I had a conversation. So or just when you pump the gas into the car, all like right, benzenes yeah. and oxygen. So I think that that's the thing is that we need to just like, um, just pay attention mm -hmm. to things and, and be aware that this is happening and that you might be exposing your family, especially your kids, to stuff that you are not um, condoning. Yeah. It's like sending your kid to school and they get spanked. And you're like, eh, I don't think that's okay. I'm going to take my kid out of school. But you didn't even know that they got spanked all day long because they were breathing stuff. It's spanking you their mean lungs. literally spanking. literally like li spanking their lungs is what's happening to your kids, mm -hmm. your kids and that can spanked. affect their behavior when we talk about endocrine <laughs> systems I don't think the, like I have just recently maybe the last couple of years realized the endocrine system is basically my experience of my world meaning mm. it's my mood it's my ability to have deep sleep it's my drive it's mental alertness it's you know and sexual function so much stuff it's like when my endocrine system is impaired that's that's like basically my fundamental experience of life is impaired and we know that it can be impaired by air yeah it even makes you fall in love with your baby right so the your birth right yeah the woman's endocrine system it, you're when you're so in love with your baby and you're like sleep deprived and you're upset at your baby but you still love your baby that's hormones doing that to you like it's important to, to do that. And so if you, I mean, all kinds of stuff can happen if you start messing with it. This is a, it's a system. Mm -hmm. It's a system. And that's what we're all about with the building science and home performance side of things. And it doesn't stop with air tightness and, right. you know, all that. Yeah, indoor air exposures can trigger heart disease, stroke, um, anxiety, depression. They it's actually, yeah, one of the things that I discovered when we were, we spent a long time talking on the phone with these researchers before we met them this week. Um, so we came really prepared. And uh, there's this study called the Global Burden of Disease, GBD. You can look it up online. Um, Global Burden of Disease is a study that's a... Um, epidemiological study, which means a statistical. What they did is they studied, uh, I think, 300 cities. And what they do is they take a couple of points of data. Like, for example, the number of deaths, hospital admissions for respiratory issues, um, etc. And then they compare that with the day-by-day uh, -day air pollution, outdoor air pollution. And they actually have found very uh, linear and very linked uh, 
you know, very obvious links between these things. So they actually can now say with some degree of certainty that air quality results in at least as many deaths in the U.S. per year as traffic fatalities. Oh my goodness. So car accidents and air quality are basically the same on the level. And, and we're not even talking and about one's like, invisible. Exactly. And then, the radar. And we're all focused on terrorists or I don't know. I don't even know what we're, you know, the, it's like data doesn't convince some people. And so this is where we need to, what's comforting to me partly is that if we realize, one of the things that might happen is that people will realize that the people who are coming up with this chemistry and indoor environment data are the same people who told me that climate is changing. Right? And so, oh, I didn't believe them then. I'm not going to believe them now. To me, that's actually very comforting because you are perfectly allowed to do whatever you want in your own house. If you want to poison your family without knowing it, that's your business. Well, I'm not going to live anywhere near you. Yeah. But, you know, that's the thing is that this is a very private thing. This is like if you, whether you make up your own mind or you, you choose to stick your head in the sand, you're going to get affected by it. And they can measure the results now. Yeah, and it, it's an impact that doesn't have a cost for society in terms of emergency readiness. There's a number I saw, and, I, and I'm not a good researcher, so I'm not going to um, cite what it was, but it was something like $209 billion is the cost of just one chemical compound's effect on the public health uh, industry. And that's the kind of stuff that we should just be thinking about. Because, yeah, we're like, we're. I think you said last night, we're the sickest mm-hmm. nation yeah, in the world, right. yeah. and we spend the most on health care. And it's not just about us trying to get, you know, perfect noses and, yeah. you know, better butts and all that stuff with liposuction. It's like, this is serious stuff that people are trying to solve and they don't even know where to begin because they don't know what compounds are in your system. Yeah, yeah. I, I just read that um, the compounds that get in your system are basically coming from indoor exposures and the dominant indoor exposure is dust and the dust particles are like candy-coated M&Ms with mm-hmm. all these crazy flame retardants. Oh, and speaking of data. Has someone ever done a study to show that when you put flame retardant in foam, it prevents deaths from fire? Aha. Uh, so, so six <laughs> I'll go classes, back to the, yeah, the Green Science America. Policy Institute actually did, has been looking at flame retardants in foam for 10 years. And they've been going in front of the IRC uh, every couple of years to That's make their case to take the, take this thing out, at least in sub-slab foam. There should at least be an option in America. Yeah. You have to buy it. How is it going to be exposed to fire? Yeah, the only place you buy flame retardant foam or uh, flame retardant free foam is Sweden, apparently, in the U.S. You have to get it shipped over there, which costs a lot of money. Wow. But crazy, right? And so, yeah, there's no oxygen. There's no flame source underground. And also, the so so the, the test that they came up with for flame uh flame proofness flame resistance is you hold a candle flame a very small flame and it has to withstand that for 12 seconds candle flame 12 seconds who invented that i don't know but it, that sounds like a very very Benjamin specific Franklin. Thing. i would bet that the guy probably the man who came up with that test is right now fuming if he could hear this he'd be like oh yeah they're using it for all this stuff i came up with that test for one situation. That's exactly right. Right? Yeah. And they're using for all this different. If you're sitting on a couch that has foam in it and the couch is upholstered, if there is something that's going to catch on fire, it's not the foam inside the couch. It's the upholstery that mm-hmm. is covering it. And now it's not a candle flame. That's a big flame. So now you've got one or two seconds tops and it basically does nothing. So what they've determined is that the flame retardants which are in do, our mattresses and babies. Which are in so much stuff. And, and if and you toys. watch, there's a, there's a documentary which I do recommend that everybody watch. It is scary. It's called Merchants of Doubt. And what it goes over, basically, is the tobacco industry. In the 70s, people were dying in, like, mattress fires and house fires from a cigarette. They were smoking in bed, and then they'd fall asleep. And instead of the cigarette industry letting itself get the blame for fires, they said, well, our home furnishes are the problem. We should have flame retards in everything. And so they made friends with the chemical manufacturing companies, and they manufactured chemicals that do flame retardant and that's what they're supposed to do but it turns out that they actually don't do what they're advertised to do we do it because we're so scared of flame it's the same thing with like fire sprinklers in every home the code a couple of years ago was like oh well we need fire sprinklers in every single new home build that is totally ridiculous um it's and what the way that code works is that you get a bunch of people in the room and they all raise their hand when you vote and that's how it works and so now we realize that like politics consensus are driven by, standards. it's crazy. So that who is making the consensus is the problem. And now we're, you know, I hope that people will think of scientific consensus, scientists, as people who are actually just looking for 
some answers to some questions. They're not trying to sell anything, especially in indoor chemistry. Yeah. There is no money in what these people are doing. Sloan Foundation is the only one that stepped up. Here, Hopefully, here. more foundations will do this. But like, yeah, these people are not trying to sell you anything. <laughs> So many of these indoor chemis- chemicals end up coating dust, you know, which are themselves possibly chemicals or organic particles, skin particles, different things, and they end up on the floor. And then for various reasons, walking through the air, you know, especially babies, but even us, we walk through a room and we end up ingesting the dust. We end up breathing it in or touching something that's dusty and then putting it in our mouth or our eye or something like that. And so they're finding out, oh, so the, the basically the pathway is from dust in the room into the people. And the funny thing is about this five-second rule. So, you know, we've always talked about, oh, I've dropped on the floor, you know, can I eat it in five seconds? Well, the reality is you already have what's on the floor in your, in your body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you don't need to worry yeah. about it. Exactly. Yeah. So any, any final thoughts? And thank you so much. As far as dust goes, um, we, we did the math on it and we lose about a pound of skin flakes per year, which oh means about 85 goodness. pounds per your entire life, which oh means that you, Christoph and I have been sitting next to each other. We're like three feet away from each other, but we've been breathing each other in, getting very, Pink very pen. intimate with each other the whole time. And you right now are, are breathing and ingesting and digesting the people around you. So that's fun, <laughs> isn't it? Anyway, stay tuned, please, for the uh, Home Diagnosis television show. You can find that at homediagnosis.tv. Uh, our, the YouTube channel, again, is called Home Performance. My uh, podcast, which is right now in a stasis uh, pattern, is called the Building Performance Podcast. You will find it's not as polished as Christoph's is, but it's the same format. All right. We will put links to all that in the show notes. And thank you so much, Corbett. Thank you. Keep up the good work. All right. You too, man. And thank you all for listening. We'll talk at you next time.